Good morning, everybody. I am Matt Sum, account executive here at Shopware, and I got Devin Glass with me here today. So I'm I'm going to do an overview of the 2D, 3D. Devin's going to demo those items. Then I'll do a couple slides on some multi-axis upgrades, and then lastly he'll he'll do some multi-axis demo files. And then there are a couple things depending on how we're running on on time, and if people want to stick around, that we can also cover at the end. Anything we didn't cover, or you want to review these more in more in depth, or other topics in Mastercam, since we're only covering mill today, you can always go to what'snew.mastercam.com, and they have a really nice, nicely laid out website with everything that's new in 2021. So going through the 2D, 3D enhancements before we get into the demos by Devin. One of the settings we added to Circle Mill Helix Bore as a as a customer request is that there's always been the start at center function, but there's now an end at center where before you would have had to create some geometry and do a little bit of a workaround to get the tool path to go right back to the center before it retracted out of the part, as opposed to using like a lead in lead out type setting. Whoops, sorry about that. Hit my mouse button. Then we also did something similar for the thread mill tool paths. So since Mastercam automatically calculates values in here based on what you put in, people would find that they would maybe adjust an allowance overcut or a, or a different value, and then it would it would affect their thread pitch or their number of active teeth values. So you now can click those little padlocks there, and that will lock in the active teeth and thread pitch, and then you're free to edit all the other parameters of the thread mill tool path without having to worry about you maintaining the pitch and active teeth settings. So one thing that I didn't have in my previous webinar here is we have some selection improvements for toolpath hole definitions when you're doing a drilling toolpath, for example. So if you're not familiar with any drill toolpath or really any toolpath in Mastercam, if you right click in the operations manager, you have the option to what's called change at point. So you can add a jump height, an extra clearance, a different depth for an individual hole or point in a drill tool path without having to reselect it or do it as a separate tool path in Mastercam. So on your selection window there, under the hole definitions, it'll now prompt you and tell you that, hey, you've modified or you have an auto cursor or a, or a specific drill point that's different than the rest and it gives you that feedback right there as opposed to before you had to kind of dig around to find out what specific geometry or points that you modified in a given tool path so it's a little bit of just visual feedback on knowing where you did the change at point function so you know you have that flexibility but you want to know what you actually change so it's a little easier to figure that out now and then also they added on the advanced tab of that same panel, you now have support for multiple solid bodies. So say you have a couple fixtures in Mastercam and the same part across there or even different parts. If you do say control click to select all holes of the same diameter, instead of just selecting holes on that given solid model, it can select across multiple solid bodies now where we couldn't do that before. This is another one that I didn't cover in the previous webinar that's a small update to the face mill tool path. So there's now a, a roll in function for face mill. This has always been how the dynamic version of the face mill works, but we know that a lot of people still like to use the traditional one way or zigzag operation in face mill. And really the benefit is of this, when you're using a face mill with the indexable inserts, the engagement of the insert is where you're gonna find the most wear and it's been proven that if you roll onto the material as you're in, as you're engaging the material, that it's a lot less stress on the inserts. So now instead of being forced to use the, the dynamic to get that benefit, you can apply the roll in now to one way and zigzag. Oh, sorry, on zigzag, it's only on the first pass, but on one way is where it'll, do it or or if you have it set to single pass which i don't see that used that often and that's a quick screenshot of what it looks like with the roll in so you're just going to get if, if if you imagine the tool coming from the left here it'll it'll roll in on onto the material per pass this is another one i i didn't talk about in the previous webinar 
when we we talked about raster to vector being re, redone in the last webinar, but we also redid the engraving algorithm or how the tool path is calculated in MasterCam. And it was hard for me to find a good example of how this looks different. And you won't necessarily see motion difference in MasterCam and Backplotter Verify. But what I did here is when you're using the Backplot function, there's a control endpoints that you can turn on. And basically each one of these white dots is where there's gonna be G-code output in the program. So you can see on the left-hand side here in 2021, there's a lot less control points to achieve the same geometry. So you're gonna get smoother machine motion, a shorter G-code file and so forth. So if you have any engraving tool pass or you do use engraving often, all, all you have to do is open up a 2020 or prior file, regenerate the toolpath in 2021, and that'll take advantage of the updated algorithm. I did mention this in the previous one, but I wanna mention it again. We added the skip pocket smaller than to the 2D dynamic mill. Previously, that was only in the OptiRough or the 3D side of the software. So it's on the entry motion tab if you're in the 2D dynamic mill and there's that skip pockets option there. And the smaller than it's based on either a percentage of the tool or a given value. So what that means is, say you have a part with a lot of small pockets and you're using a half inch end mill and the pocket is maybe slightly over a half inch. So depending on your radius size of the dynamic motion, the tool can technically fit in there and pocket that out. But maybe you're using a tool that's not designed to helix into the material and you only wanna have plenty of room for that tool to move. Maybe you're doing an, an initial roughing tool path. So what that does is it allows you to skip those pockets so you can go back and maybe do those with a smaller tool and not having to worry about chaining as many things because as you guys have learned with our new chaining techniques you know i can select all all loops or all all pockets now with 2d so it can just simplify and make it easier to approach the part in exactly the way you want and we also added the skip all pockets so you know say you only want to do you know channels or open pocket sections of the part as that was also added, the skip all was also added to the 3D OptiRough as well. So if you don't wanna do any you know, helixing into the part and just make sure that it approaches from the outside, for example, you can just say skip all and then it won't do any interior pockets. I think I saw a couple questions come through, but I think Devin's taking care of it. And if you guys wanna see, you can view the chat log on the right where the go-to webinar expands and see any answers that are responded to the entire group here. Another small couple changes before I pass it over to Devin here. The system will now warn you if your tool name does not match the attributes. What that means is a lot of us will do this, you know, you, you pull a default tool from the library that's close to what you have in the machine, and then you make a couple small adjustments. So in my example here, my name is a 350 center drill, but say I modified that center drill because it's actually a 301 center drill. I'm, I'm just picking a random number as an example here. But Mastercam will warn you saying, hey, this is a, this tool is defined as a size that the name doesn't match up to. So that when you know you're generating a setup sheet or documents for a given part, someone doesn't get confused saying, oh, you know, the setup sheet's calling out a 35 center drill, but it's programmed with a 301. So that allows you to give you a little reminder that, hey, I should update the name of the tool since I updated the parameters of that given tool. So just a little quality of life update, but, but a good, good change, I think. This one we mentioned last time as well, but I, but I think it'll be useful for quite a few people. There's now a check tool reach function in MasterCam. So similar to the analyze holder function in that it doesn't need existing tool pass to work. In my screenshot example here, you can see that 
I have the tool set to manual. And if I back up here, I can define a cutting diameter radius, all, all the important factors of a given tool without having to select a tool from my library or from an operation, just to kind of give me an idea of maybe how I need to approach this part and how long a tools I need to get into certain features. And then you have customizable colors there as well on how those look. And it's on the same area as the check holder command that was moved over from a C hook a couple versions ago as the check tool reach under the analyze tab on the mill parameters pay or tab within Mastercam. So without further ado, Devin's gonna cover some 2D, 3D demo topics here. And that's just a quick list of what he's gonna cover. My name is Devin Glass. Uh, like Matt said, I've been, I'm in applications here. I did the mill section for the webinar before. So like Matt said, there might be a little bit of review, especially here at first, because I'm gonna be using very similar files, just with a little bit different here and there and just kind of clarifying on maybe some questions I saw get brought up uh, through or since then. So the first thing we're gonna hop into is gonna be our our drilling section here, kind of like what that slide showed. I like to show the chamfer, uh, the chamfer side of it first. Um, the chamfer drill, uh, it was added in 2020 where say for instance, I have these two dowel holes and I have these two counter bore holes and I need to get a, I need to spot drill them, but I also need to get a, make sure I have a 10 thou corner break on all those holes. Well, before what you'd have to do is you'd have to do a drill tool path, select these two dowel holes, make sure they're at the correct depth, then do a separate drill tool path, do the two counter bore holes and make sure they're at the same, this correct depth to get that 10 thou corner break for both, for each of them. Um, not very ideal, but what we can do now, and I'll move my insertion arrow back up to the top here. So to say, if I'm putting in like, say a, a spot drill, we have what's known as chamfer drill down here in the hole making. And I just select the arcs like I normally would. I'm just selecting the solid edge. Now this tool path does require a arc of some sort. So either a solid arc, a wireframe arc, or just the hole in general, it just needs that diameter and that, and that depth. And we'll talk about that here in a moment. So green check, grab my spot drill. I just got grabbed a one inch from the tool library. If we go to the cut parameters, you'll see that it's very stripped down from uh, other tool paths that we have in Mastercam because this is very automated. So currently I'm just gonna put in what corner break I have because nothing's drawn on there. I'm just gonna say 10 thou, a 10 thou corner break on all the holes. This does have tool axis control, which I'll show you here in a little bit. Linking parameters, we don't have a depth because the depth is being calculated based off what corner break we added or what chamfer we're trying to put on there, um, plus wherever the hole is located in the space. So the position of the hole is very important. This position of the geometry is very important. So I'm gonna say it's up stock zero, and then I'm gonna set my clearance to six inches absolute just to make it safe above the, uh, above the, above the part here. And I'm just gonna go straight into the verify with this whole shebang, except for the peck drill there. I'm gonna go to the verify with the whole shebang just so we can see it. And we'll skip to the chamfer drill or the spot drill. Or actually that was the first thing that happened. But you can see here, we got a 10th out corner break on each of these holes. It's kind of hard to tell, but they are even. So no matter what the diameter is or where they're located in Z, um, you can have a consistent chamfer. And how it's calculating that is based off where the hole is located in space. So where the, locate, the hole is located in Z or the geometry is located in Z and the diameter of said hole or circle or arc. And it's using that plus the angle of our tool to establish how far deep it has to go on a hole by hole basis. So now we can do all our holes in one go and then we get access to sorting options. We don't have to have three or four tool paths or however many drill tool paths for each and every different sized hole to get a constant chamfer all the way through. Now that's great, but what happens when we have different sized chamfers for different sized holes? Well, I've taken that into account. 
we'll switch over to here. And here, it's hard to tell a little bit, but now we have a pretty large chamfer on one side and then a smaller chamfer on the counter bores. And they are different sized. So again, I'm just gonna move my insertion arrow down just above the pec drill and I'm gonna do a chamfer drill. And again, I can pick on either the top or the bottom of the chamfer, but for clarity's sake, I'm just gonna pick on the top of the chamfer. Because remember, this is looking at the depth and the diameter and the relationship between them. So if you click on the bottom of the chamfer, the depth will be compensated based off the diameter of that chamfer. However, if your chamfer is not drawn correctly, we might run into some issues. But I'm gonna hit the green check, spot drill selected, go to my cut parameters. Now, if I leave this at 10 thou or whatever there, it's going to gouge it by 10 extra thou. So we need to make sure to zero that out, just like we would if we were using, say, if we were cutting a contour around a chamfer on the outside of the part and the chamfer's already drawn. Skip to linking parameters, this should all be the same. We'll hit the green check. And again, I'll throw this sucker into the verify so we can kind of see it. And we'll skip to the end. And you can see here, we got fairly large chamfers on that, those dowels holes and fairly small chamfers on those counter bores. So that is that is the chamfer drill. It, it makes it much easier to, excuse me, makes it much easier to do a constant chamfer no matter the size of the hole or where it's located at. And if this hole was say deep in a pocket or on a boss somewhere, again, that doesn't matter because it's looking at the relationship of the Z and the diameter of that hole. So it will compensate for that. And now real quick, I'm just gonna go ahead and go back a step. Not that it really matters which model I draw it on, but I'm gonna go ahead and we'll just do a chamfer drill on all these holes on the cone. Uh, the difference on this part is I put flats on it so we can see that constant chamfer all throughout. So I'll do the chamfer drill. Um, some of you guys may not know this, but if you hold the control key, when you click on the inside of this bore here, it'll grab all the holes in matching diameter. And you can see here, as long as all my arrows are pointing outwards, my axes are good, or my, my tilt axis is good. So I was able to get all those holes with just one mouse click. I'll green check, make sure it's got my spot drill. I'll go back in my cut parameters. I'll give it another 10th out corner break. Oh. And the dual axis control, I just switch it to the five axis. Yep, it's just warning me that, hey, you know, you can't really have absolute in a five axis mode, which is fine. We get into linking parameters. These are now locked into incremental. That's fine. Might bump down the clearance a little bit. Three inches, all that looks good. And we'll just screen check. Looks like my sorting's a little bit off, but that shouldn't be a problem. Now, if I take both these guys into the verify, skip through all the drill holes, and then we'll play through that. It's a little quick, but now you can see we have those chamfers. Devin, if I actually threw it, we do have one question that I'm not sure the answer on. It is, does the chamfer drill have a place to comp for a tip flat on a spot drill? Um, I don't believe it does. I think if you if you have the if you have the flat uh established in the tool definition itself, that'll be compensated in the depth. Um but I don't think there's a way in the tool path itself to add anything for a flat. But if you have that flat drawn in the tool your depth will be compensated as long as that flat is drawn accurately. That makes sense. Yeah, I, yeah, I think that sounds right. Yeah, we can we can double check that later too, Jake. I know on that calculator that we're used to when we're doing the drill tool path, we can add a flat in there um, after the fact, but that's just because we're just throwing in the numbers and it's figuring out. This tool path, what it's doing is it's looking at the geometry of our tool and rolling with that. So if we have that flat drawn on there, our depth would be deeper um, and or so on and so forth there. 
But yeah, this completely this works with multi-access too, so that's definitely good. And so will the next drill toolpath we're gonna talk about. So in order to talk about that, I'm gonna switch gears a little bit. Gonna switch to this guy and move my insertion arrow down to that guy. So this is the this is the best part I could come up with to kind of show um, one of the one of the many uses for this part or for this tool I should say. Uh, I know this is something people have been asking for for quite a while, so we're glad to deliver on it. But in this situation, if I wanted to say if I wanted to drill through this, drill through this top section, but once I get through this empty section, I don't really need a pack or chip break. I don't need anything special in there. I wanna just speed through this empty section that's already milled out, and I wanna start drilling through this bottom area again. Well, before, that was kind of a pain because we had to either write it by hand in the G-code or come up with some kind of custom drill cycle um, through the post that would do it. And for something like this, it's so applications based, unless you're doing 5 million of these and fa different families of parts, it probably wouldn't be worth it. So now they've added in 2021, advanced drill. And for that, I'm just gonna grab the top arc here. Green check. I have a one inch drill there, straight to the cut parameters. Now on the chamfer drill, well the chamfer drill was, um, was very dumbed down or, or stripped down. This is a lot more complicated because we are given full control on everything this toolpath is doing. So as you guys probably saw from my previous webinar, I like to add a few extra segments and then delete them when I don't want them anymore. Um, these feeds and speeds here, my tool is not really set. So these are kind of flat, that 0 0.0001, but we'll change these per, per, uh, per segment here. So the first step I want to go to, if I click in depth, right click, C coordinate of a point, I'm going to grab the bottom of this, uh, this section here. So that's negative three inches. Then I'll give it a feed rate of, let's say, um, 20 inches a minute. You know, just throwing stuff out there. RPM, we'll say 500, just keeping nice flat numbers. And again, guys, you know, I'm not, I'm not putting realistic numbers in these speeds and feeds, but that's not the point. You know, we could say, oh, I want the coolant to turn on. So I'll switch to flood. If we need any dwell with the segment selected, we can come down here. I could say I want tip compensation. So that's going to drive that 118 degree just past wherever that depth is at negative three inches. I'll give it a little bit of a breakthrough. I'll say negative uh, 0.05. Whoop, fat finger. Again, you have to put a negative in here because theoretically we could keep, we could add a number in here and have it be positive and stay off the bottom of the hole just a hair. Um, in case, like, say you were putting a reamer through and you didn't want that reamer to bottom out, you could add more to that depth. We could have pecking, so I could say, you know, chip break. These numbers should be fine. I can add a comment. I could say drill through top. I can add my own manual code. So if I said like I wanted an M0 for whatever reason, or if I needed like uh, the chip conveyor to come on in a particular time or what have you, we can write that in. So I could say M00, again, it wouldn't make much sense, but just to show you, you can see here as I'm adding these, it's adding a list of operations. So maybe I don't want the M00 to come first. Maybe I want the comment to come first. So I'm gonna move that up the list and maybe move the code right before the com or right after the comment so I can, it'll hit the stop and then I can do my, do what I need to. So then once I got that segment done, I'll go to the next segment, I'll click in the depth, right click, see coordinate of a point, click to that point. And for this one, I wanna speed up the feed by a lot because this is air uh, essentially. I'll do this, I'll turn off the spindle just to show you we can, we'll turn off that spindle for, for whatever reason. And you know, if we turn off the spindle, we don't need an RPM, so I'll just leave that zero. And I'll turn the coolant off. And maybe like right here, I, maybe I don't want to, maybe I don't want to go negative, maybe I want to go positive. So I want to say like uh, about 100 thou from the bottom of that depth, instead of changing that depth there. Don't need packs, don't need any of this. We can leave this be, move on to the next segment. Z coordinate of a point, grab this bottom point here. And so negative 
and I'll give it a feed rate, maybe make it 10 clockwise, RPM, 300, why not? And we'll turn on like through tool. Tip compensation, turn that on, go like negative 100 thou. Could turn on packing, but I'm not gonna bother. Could put a comment, but I'm not gonna bother. We'll just leave it there. I don't need this this second to last segment, so I'm just gonna take that out and I'll give this retract a pretty pretty hefty feed, maybe like 60 there. So 60 is gonna come out um, at that. And you can see as I'm as I'm building this. I can see the drill being built over here on the right. So we can then click on the segment and then make our edits. And then make our edits. Again, this works for multi-axis. Go in my linking parameters. I'll bump down my clearance a little bit because I, I have this now at Z0. I'll bump down my retract. I'll maybe make that 100 thou incremental. Now we have a top of stock and it's locked in incremental and we don't have a depth because we just established every single depth uh, verbatim. But that being said, the depth in the top of stock is incremental. So let's say for instance, this hole wasn't at Z0. Let's say this hole wasn't at Z0. Maybe it was at Z of two inches, Z of one inches. This advanced drill would still work because it's working off wherever the geometry is. So it's incremental. That was a question we had last time that I didn't feel like I went, I didn't clarify at all. So that looks good. Green check, get the axes all the way, get a um, section view of it. If I back plot it and turn off my endpoints. So it's doing its chip breaks. Goes goes right back, goes down a hundred thou from the top of that hole, just goes right through and comes all the way back out. And if I were to post this guy, you can see it's all longhand code. So we did that because you know you're 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 literally writing out the path. So it has to be longhand. Unfortunately, there's no real easy way to integrate this with a can cycle. So if there is a can cycle in your machine that you're trying to utilize this for, you will have to probably go into a post option and make an actual custom drill cycle for that post to utilize a an existing can cycle in your machine. But if longhand will do, this will give you a lot of power to how it's feeding in and feeding out. Okay. And there's that comment I put on there. There's the M00, spindle speed, coolant coming on, so on and so forth there. Okay. So that's the drilling section. Um, next, we'll talk about the pre-machining corners. So I will grab that. So this part will look familiar if you guys are if you guys went to or watched our previous webinar. But what this this is supposed to show is just kind of a, a generic dynamic toolpath, dynamic 2D. And what we were finding when we were getting answers from customers, when our customers were running the dynamic toolpath at its absolute limits or running the tool at its absolute limits, um, what we would notice is, or what the customer would see is in the corners, specifically when it's looping around this corner here, is where the tool would take just a little bit too much of a load and break. Now, normally, if 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 uh, if you're not pushing your tools to the absolute limits, it it could handle that excess of load right there in that corner. But for those where, if you even add just a thou of uh, of engagement, it will break the tool. It was breaking the tools in those corners. So what was added was a corner pretreatment page in the parameters because before the only way you could really help with that is to change your first pass offset or your first pass feed reduction. But the problem there was it would offset that entire path outwards. So if it was only breaking in the corners, well now you're offsetting not only in the corners but all the way around. So Mastercam added corner pretreatment. When you turn this sucker on, you got a few options. It will do, it can do climb, conventional, or zigzag. 
we can tell it to include the corners in this toolpath or just create a or just let this only be the corners and then we'll do the rest on a different toolpath. So in the case of you wanted to use a different tool to just get the corners and then come in with a, the with your actual rougher to rough out the rest, you could do that too. We could do it by corner or by depth if we have depth cuts turned on. Different step over in case we need to be a little easier on those corners. Uh, different, uh, or we can have the corners have their own step down as opposed to just depth cuts. And then minimum corner radius there, different speeds and feeds there for the corners only. And what this will give us is you can see here, just from going back and forth, it'll add an extra pass, but it's cutting this corner, micro lift feeding to the next corner, cutting that corner, micro lift feeding to the next corner, cutting that corner, so on and so forth until it's finally finished and then it starts doing its cutting. If it felt the need to if the step over was small enough and there was a, it was a big enough corner as opposed to a, a big enough corner to a small tool, then it would do multiple passes uh, or multiple step overs on those corners. But in this case, the tool is right around the same size uh, as the corner, so it can just log it out with the 25% step over I have set. And like I said before, you could have the corners just by themselves. So if you just wanted it to trim out the corners and then come in with a different dynamic mill with like say a different tool or different settings uh, we can do that too. So that pretty much talks about the pre-machining corners I just wanted to retouch on that. Um, the next one is something we didn't talk about or, or talk about in um, if we did talk about it it was in a in a, in a slide here. I'm just going to carry it over here. So this is a very very simplistic part I drew up. Uh, definitely nothing fancy but um, you can see here, I've roughed out these channels and I'm wanting to finish them. So if I look at my first contour, what I've done is, oh, hey, yeah, I've, I've extended the exit. I've made the lead in a little, or set to perpendicular instead of tangent because I'm worried about it hitting this wall. So I got it all set here and I'm trying to take a shortcut. I copy the tool path, and then I set my new geometry as this other site. But remember, I still want to go in a climb, climb direction. So now I'm going into the slot instead of coming out of the slot. So as you could probably imagine, now my lead in and lead out is incorrect. It's going to collide here when I try to extend out here. Well, in 2020, or I'm sorry, 2021, if you go on the lead in lead out page, on you guys are probably familiar with the uh, bump one way or the other, so you can copy the entry to the exit or exit to the entry, but now we have a swap, so if we wanted to swap this out, we can. Same goes for the adjust contour. We can swap that as well. Green check, regenerate it, and now they're the same there. So that's the new swap uh, a button that they added in the lead in lead out. For the next thing um, that they added in that lead in lead out, uh, it's, it'd be easier to show you um, by recreating the toolpath itself. So in this case, you, let's say I want to engrave these letters using contour and an engraving tool. So I'll start a new contour, I'll put it in top view, window, window around these guys, pick a start point, there we go, chain them all. Make sure to grab my engraver, turn my compensation off. I'm going to leave lead in, lead out untouched for now. Go straight to linking and maybe go a little bit deeper. Okay, so when we're doing engraving, generally you don't want any lead in, lead out because you'll get something like this here. And actually, it may be easier to see if I didn't make it go below the surface. There we go. The lead in, lead out is gonna cause these little tails on your letters, which is definitely not what we want. So, what we used to do in the past was just flat out turn off our lead in, lead out altogether. But then we run into an issue. Whoop, turn that off. Well, now it's just plunging into the material, which isn't favorable. It's it's just going to plunge right in, which is not what I would like. 
in 2021, we've added the uh, ability to kind of ramp in as opposed to um, as opposed to just being tangent or perpendicular. So we'll say a profile ramp. Note it grays out everything else in my uh, box here except for my ramp angle, which I'll just leave at three degrees, and I'll carry that over to the exit, green check, regenerate it. So now we get an actual profile ramp downward. You can see maybe the three degrees was a little bit too big because now it's having trouble getting back, getting all the way down. So we'll say profile ramp. Uh, one degree. Oh, I went the wrong way. Of course I did. Profile ramp, 15 degrees. So now we're ramping into the material as opposed to just plunging in and taking off from there. And as, as you can imagine, if we're doing an engraving, this is going to be submerged a little bit, but I put it on the front, on the top face so we can see it a little bit better. So that's one application, do a profile ramp. Um, you could also do it on an outside contour if you wanted to ramp on to the outside edge. I think I saw a question come in about, is there a way to adjust the ramp height? I believe that is done via the top of stock in the feed plane here. So if I set this to 0.05, so that's done with a mixture of the top of stock, setting where the feed plane should start when set to incremental, and mainly the feed plane there. Is there a way to swap the lead in and added to any other toolpaths? Unfortunately, the swap is only added to the contour at this time, the contours lead in, um, as far as I'm aware. Um, I don't think this even has a lead in. Yeah, I believe it's only the contours lead in page that that's added into. Yeah, I think because that's the only toolpath with that specific in yeah, I'm pretty sure. I was trying to think if there was another one that had that UI, but I can't I can't think of another one. Right. Okay. Multi-axis swap lead in would be nice. Yeah, we can definitely we can definitely write that down and add it as a request. And guys, if you ever have a request for Mastercam, feel free to reach out to us and let us know because we we pass everything along to corporate or corporate and uh, it all gets into a list that gets added in as uh, requests for the next version of Mastercam. So if there's anything you guys are curious about or you guys think would be a good addition, just feel free to reach out and we can we can definitely get the ball rolling on that. Can't make any promises that it, it'd be added in soon, but we can definitely get, get, get it to the right people. Okay. Well, um, I believe that's it for the 2D section, at least for what I have. Oh, and I almost forgot to talk about this though. Uh, so if I hop back to say one of my drill tool paths here, um, sure, we'll grab one of these. Because I forgot to mention this here. So um, this, there was an add addition to the linking parameters, and this is for all 2D toolpaths and 3D toolpaths, um, where we have the arc fit, arc fit on maximum radius here. And what this will do is if I turn this on and I give it, say, like a uh, quarter of an inch per sec, I give it a quarter of an inch. Watch what happens to the top corners of these uh, rapids. So what this will do is this will rapid not in one axis at a time, or in this case, it's not going to go up in Z, X and Y, down in Z. It's going to go up in Z to a particular height, about a quarter inch below what I said. Then it's going to use, it's going to create a linearized arc of rapids to transition that motion into an X and Y travel, and then vice versa into a Z. So it's transitioning into that movement 
And what we found, the reason why this was added was because we found in older machines or uh, m machines that had trouble keeping up, it had trouble coming to a complete stop and then moving in X and Y, coming to a complete stop, moving down in Z. And of course, it'd be like a microsecond of a complete stop, but it still had to slow down to get to that, that stop. But with this arc, you were making a transition, you're transitioning into that different motion direction, so that momentum is being carried. It doesn't need to come to a complete stop, so it can change the momentum. It's transitioning that momentum at a different angle or a different uh, direction. Um, so that's a small add-on that was added. And just a quick note, you're not gonna see G2s and G3s in here. It's only gonna be G1 or G0s. It's gonna be rapid linear motion. So when you post this out, it's gonna say G0, X, Y, Z, X, Y, Z, X, Y, Z, and it's gonna be faceted like you see here. But again, we're trying to just take that momentum and carry it in a different direction as opposed to coming to a complete stop and moving to that other direction. So that was a real quick one. I almost forgot to add in there. I have it in my notes here, but it's a little blip. So now we'll get into the 3D section here. And the first thing we're going to talk about, you know, this is going to be a little bit of a, just a quick, quick one, I think. Um, but there was a lot of improvements done to the Blend HST toolpath. Uh, so back in 2020, uh, well, actually, let me go back a little bit further. Back in 2019, Blend was not part of the HST toolpath family. So we couldn't use multi-threading and when it came to new features that would come out with the HST toolpath, it was left out of the left out of the fun. In 2020, they added Blend to the HST toolpath uh, family, but uh, it just didn't have the 3D capabilities. So what would that look like? Well, if I were to go to a top view and this is what Blend would look like when you have 2D, when I set a maximum step over, it's only looking at that step over from an X and Y perspective. So it's only looking for the max distance from this line to that line, 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 which, you know, in some cases is really good. But in this case, it doesn't see the Z depth. So when it gets to this wall, you can see here that it's missing this entire section here and it's just doing all kinds of weird stuff there. Um, so the 2D, the 2D uh, blend was all we had for the HST toolpath back in 2020. Well, now in 2021, we have the 3D blend setting in there now. So now it looks a little better like this, a little more like this here. Um, now it's looking at the step over from a 3D perspective instead of just an X and Y perspective. Uh, so that was a nice addition there. Now that it's part of the HST toolpath family, you have access to multi-threading, you have access to new features that come out for just the HST in general. Not only that, there was an added feature where you can, in the cut parameters, you could say a number of passes. So like I just put in here like 100 passes, but you could say like five or four. Green check. Regen. And we can we can establish the number of passes we want to take there. Now, of course, that is far fewer than we what I'd want, but it just kind of helps speed things up on the uh, the regeneration when I'm talking about these other spots. You also may have noticed flip step over. So as that would say, you know, let's say for instance you didn't chain these in the proper order, you changed left or you chained the left side to the right side, but you want it to be right to left. Well, before you'd have to rechain that or change the order of those chains. Now you can just click a checkbox and it'll flip the uh, flip the order. I believe I see a question here that says the is the HST uh, blend for level one or level two seats. Um, that is for the 3D the 3D seat. So I believe that would be level two. So that'd be the 3D seat of or of mill. Another another add-on was in the uh, in the uh, toolpath control where you select the blend curves. You also have not only the tool tip, so the very bottom of the tool. You also have tool contact point. So let's say, for instance, you don't want that tool to come all the way up onto that corner. We can say the tool contact point, 
and then it will make sure that it's only looking at it from wherever the tools make a contact with that wall. So you can stop it, stop it short if you need to. Very similar or almost exactly the same as the, uh, as the containment boundary tool contact point. Okay, that's pretty much all I had for the blend tool path. Um, again, now that we have that 3D functionality, we now have all the functionality we did before with the previous blend, just with the with new features and now with the multi-threading uh, functionality. So good there. Okay, next on the leads and extensions here. Okay. So here you can see that we have uh, just a 3D toolpath. Um, currently, it's a equal scallop using this bottom seed curve. Uh, so an added functionality to the 3D toolpaths in the linking parameters is this apply transitions uh, checkbox. So before, all these leads would only be applied to the entry and the exit. But now, if I check this box here, it will apply this lead in and lead out on the transit, excuse me, the transitions. So I regenerate it after checking that box. And now you can see we have a lead in and lead out on every single pass. And of course, that's all being pulled in from that, that lead in lead out page. It's pretty simple enough. Another added feature to that was this extension. So what the extension will do is the extension will extend that face out tangently or, stand, or extend that toolpath out tangently to the face, sort of like what we would normally do when we would create a lip on the outside of that face to make sure that it doesn't curl down into a corner. So if I add an extension here, say like a quarter of an inch, Then I have to, if I green check right now and I regenerate it, without this checkbox checked, it's only going to apply that quarter inch on the lead in and the lead out. So I need to make sure to have this checked. And I'll zero out the horizontal because I don't really need the horizontal entry and exit. Regenerate it. And oh, it's millimeters. Gets me every freaking time. <laughs> like five millimeters. There we go. These dang metric files throw me off. But you can see now we can tangently uh, expand on that. And I don't have any of these other faces selected, by the way. I only have this face right here selected. Okay. So that's kind of the added added linking in the uh, lead in lead out. This next one will be really quick, um, and it's going to be pretty much verbatim from the last webinar. But uh, in the raster toolpath before, you know, we could only set a machining angle from zero to 360 degrees, which in this case is set to zero, which is great for these horizontal pegs, but not great for the vertical or diagonal pegs. So what we've added in the cut parameters page is right next to the machining angle, we have automatic. And what automatic will do is it'll look for the longest edge of each feature and make that the temporary machining angle. So you can see here now it's optimized for each of these pegs. So that one's really quick, but I just wanted to touch up on that again. Okay. So. I think that's it for the 3D, Matt. If you wanna, if you wanna take back control for the multi-axis presentation. Okay, great. Hi guys, Matt again here. Just got a couple slides on multi-axis, five-axis applications, and then I'll pass it back over to Devin for the final demo part. So the first one here is multi-axis rough is now called Pocket. That's just clearing up some confusion that people had with this toolpath in the past because you would go to maybe rough an outside part of a part and it wouldn't 
have walls or it wouldn't be a pocketed feature and it would ask you to select the walls of the area and you're thinking, oh, I don't have any walls to select. I just want to machine this section. Well, we cleared up that confusion by now calling it multi-axis pocket. So you do need a pocket-like feature or something with a floor and walls in order for it to be programmed. And the enhancements to the tool path is we've added floor and wall finishing to the tool path, and it also supports undercuts now. And those have been optimized for the, what we call accelerated finishing tools. So think of the lens or barrel shaped tools that we started supporting over the past couple versions. So that's really where the geometry of the tool can match up with the tilt of your multi-axis machine to take a step over from say, you know, 5 thou to 120 thou per pass and get the same RA type finish by utilizing those, those tools. Then we have some performance improvements and I mentioned this in the last webinar as well, but there were a handful of multi-axis tool paths that were optimized and enhanced here for 2021. And I have the ones that were specifically worked on highlighted there. So it's morph parallel along curve and project curve. But what you're gonna see in these tool paths is they're just gonna have smoother and tool motion as well as faster calculation times. So what that means is, you know, the technical terms is it's gonna have better surface accuracy. So how it follows a given solid face or surface model. And then the normal resolution, you know, especially if you have a surface model over a solid model, anyone that's dealt with those in the past will know, you know, depending on how your normals are set, it can affect the motion of the tool path. So there are tools in Mastercam to make sure that all the normals are in the right direction. But even if you have a part with a lot of complex surfaces on there where the normals are kind of going all over the place, even though they're all pointing the correct direction, you know, out of the part, it'll, it'll still optimize the motion of the tool path better. So that's just gonna result in better surface finish on a given part using any of these tool paths. And lastly, you're gonna see 20 to 40% calculation improvements amongst all those tool paths in 2021. So if you go to regenerate a 2020 part file in 2021, you'll, you'll see those performance gains regardless of the hardware of the PC that you have. One I didn't mention in the last webinar, kind of a smaller update and a tool path that might not be used all that often, but for anyone with a fourth axis CNC and they do rotary parts, we now have adaptive versus constant depth cuts for the rotary advanced tool path. And you'll see there in, I have a little screenshot here below, in 2020, you just had the distance of what your depth step would be, where now you, you can set your distance, but then you could also set a minimum distance based off of that as a as a percentage so in the example here you know the my minimum step over is 70 percent of that 42 that i defined as the depth step so it it will adjust that based on the geometry of the part and devin might be able to explain this maybe better than me but you know as you're approaching from the outside in into a part you know, you're, you're gonna be engaging more material. So you wanna adjust that depth step based on the amount of material. Because when you're working with a rotary part, it's similar to when you're working with a lathe, the engagement's gonna be higher as you're going through a, a larger diameter. And it's kind of hard to tell in the picture there, but there's there's adjustments to those depth steps based on how they how they work. And then the last part, of the enhancement to this tool path is they have a smoothing function that appears in the bottom right of that cut pattern page. And what that does is it'll, the corners percentage will apply fillets or round off sharp corners on inner contours of the part. And the final contour percentage does the same for corners that are on the OD of, of the part. So it's just a easy way to smooth out tool motion depending on the geometry of the part where you don't want it to make aggressive moves you know if you're doing a full rotary fourth tool path you don't want the machine jerking around as maybe the rotary is trying to index or rotate around as it's doing a particular tool path 
And that was just a couple slides I had on multi-axis. So Devin, I'll pass it back over to you. Yeah, I, I guys, and I won't I won't go into a huge amount of detail. I'm just going to tackle some key points that I I mentioned with the last time I did a three plus two automatic for the previous webinar, um, because I think a lot of that a lot of that stuff is per, is still kind of valid. Um, but I just want to talk about a few key points instead of going through my whole monologue about the three plus two automatic. Um, but as you probably remember from the last webinar, or if you if you haven't heard uh, this, we've added a toolpath called Advanced, or I'm sorry, 3 plus 2 Automatic Roughing. And what this will allow you to do is this will search your part. If you have it set to automatic, it will search your part and try to find the most material it can cut away mathematically. And in my previous webinar, I talked about how that's not quite the best thing in the world. Uh, it also has two other modes where it has semi-automatic and manual. Um, but what this will do is this will do a similar toolpath to OptiRough, not, not exactly, a similar toolpath to OptiRough, depending on what views it found or what views you're giving it. Uh, it'll do an OptiRough, then it'll go to the next view, link to the next view, rough, then do go to the next view, rough, and so on and so forth. Um, the the warning I want to give you guys and the warning I gave before in the previous webinar is be careful with three plus two automatic with the tool pl or tool plane set to automatic or tool axis set to automatic because it's going to make some uh, it's going to make some educated decisions not based off machining principles but based on mathematical principles. So in this situation. It's currently set to automatic across the board with a 15 degree step. So every 15 degree, 15 degree steps, if you feel the need, add a uh, add a perspective or add a tool axis. And if I rotate my part here, you can see that the tool is coming at this weird 45 degree here. Actually, it's not even quite 45 degree. But the reason why it's doing that is because mathematically, it can it sees that it can get the most material by going the hypotenuse of this triangle. So as opposed to doing a top and a right side, it thinks, oh, I can get most of it by coming in a diagonal. But us as machinists, we know that you know, you're not gonna fit into this pocket very well. You're not gonna fit into that section very well. So we run into the situation where the, the analogy I used before was, um, it's kind of like if I asked the computer, how do I get from Indianapolis to Chicago? to rule out uh, Google Maps. If I, if I asked a dumb computer, how do, I, how do I get from Indianapolis to Chicago? They'd probably say a straight line from A to B at your fastest speed. But us as drivers, and in this analogy, us as machinists know that you know, we can't do that. We have, to, we have to drive on roads. We'd be going through woods and, and, and houses. So we need to take, we need to drive on this interstate, take this exit, avoid this toll, go to this drive, or this road and all that stuff. You know, this automatic toolpath is not automatic in the sense that it's going to magically rough your part for you. It's automatic in the sense that we give it simple directions such as like top, front, right, left, and back, and it rolls with it and it works with that. And that's the automatic section of it. It, it. We give it simple directions and it'll rough from those perspectives without having to worry about stock models, without having to worry about linking, without having to worry about anything anything that has to do with it transitioning from position to position. Now, is it, is it gonna be great right out of the gate, set to manual? Not necessarily. So in this situation, I have a manual here. You can see we have it going to top. We got it going at a weird. We got it going at a little bit of a, a little bit of a different angle to match one of the flats on the right side here, and then we have it going on the front. And this is all done in the tool axis page, tool axis control, in through vectors. So something I didn't show in the previous webinar is how these get set. These are not planes, although we can pull in a plane. These are vectors. So the idea is if you bring this toolpath, if you import this toolpath from a separate file, you don't need to bring that plane along for the ride. You can, it'll come in with the vectors. So that way we don't have to worry about, oh, do I have this plane defined already before I import this in? These are established vectors. But if I right click and select the tool plane, 
we have all these options. We can pick a named plane. We could pick a tool plane. We could pick the last, dynamic, rotate, solid face. Once we pick on a solid face, it's just like plane creation, although the X, Y, and Z doesn't matter in this case. It's just the vector. You can see here, it added. So it's vectors, not necessarily, uh, not necessarily planes itself. So where I think this toolpath really shines is when we do it set to manual and we have it come in the standard views we're used to, or if there's a particular fit or particular feature that needs to be at a weird angle, kind of like what they have here, we can set that. It keeps track of the stock at the entirety of the toolpath. So when it's going from top to front, it knows where there's material, it knows where it needs to cut. However, when compared side by side with the tr more traditional method where we do and we set a plane, OptiRough, stock model, set a plane, OptiRest, stock model, set a plane, OptiRest, stock model, so on and so forth. Um, the OptiRest method is more efficient um, because this does not quite have dynamic motion, full dynamic motion. It has it has trichoidal motion and it has middle of the line trichoidal motion, but it doesn't have fully fledged dynamic. It has a little bit of catching up to do there, and it will do some air cutting. So the 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 what I boiled it down to in the previous webinar is this could be programmed quickly if you have if you have it set up correctly and you import it in. This could prog or cut down on your programming time but it will take longer on your tool pathing time. While the OptiRef will take longer to program, it will take less time at the machine. So it really depends on where your priorities are at, depending on a job by job basis. And again, like I said, you know, even when you have it set to manual, it's not perfect right out of the gate because you can see here, it's trying to cut underneath here because there's no, there's no avoidance set to tell it to not go down there. So it thinks it can. We don't have any steep and shallow to prevent it. So we need to add more material like extra stock or extra check just to prevent it from trying to go underneath the part. So there's there's a couple things we need to keep in mind. And like I said, uh, this, is, this really could just be an entire hour or two on its own, just kind of going through and practicing it. But unfortunately for this, we're just gonna stick with just, hey, this is what you need to know about it. Um, so that's the, that's the automatic three plus two. I'm um, sorry I couldn't go into depth a little bit more on that one, uh, but we're going to go ahead and this one should be semi-quick. I know we're we're kind of in the overtime here, but this one was we were kind of looking forward to when we saw it, but we just couldn't fit it in the previous webinar. So on morphine toolpaths, and I believe it's also I've also seen it in a parallel toolpath, but don't I'm not quite sure. I'll have to double check that. But on a morph toolpath, um, yeah, it's only morph. What am I thinking? On a morph toolpath, you know, we're we're going from one curve to another curve. But if the to curve or the from curve is smaller than the other, you can see here it kind of tries to wrap around itself, which could be problematic. Um, we don't want that kind of motion. It doesn't look good at all. Well, what they added in 2021 is if I go into the toolpaths here, excuse me, and I believe it's under cut pattern. Parameters for surface edge handling. We have this extend edge curve turned on. And I believe this was a slide in the previous webinar, but this kind of helps show it. So when I turn that guy on, what it'll do is it doesn't look like it changed the geometry at all, but it's looking for the shorter chain and extending it so it matches the length of the other chain here. So you can see here now this small line is in the background being extended to match wherever this chain ends from starts to end. So now we get a nice back and forth flow where it's not rolling in on itself. And that's just, again, that's just in the cut parameters, under the cut, or um, under the cut parameter, or bleh, can't talk. Under the cut pattern in the parameter for surface edge handling is this extend edge curve. So it's going to look for the shorter of the two and extend it so they match the same length and you don't have that roll in. Okay.
So that's that's all I had for the multi-axis there. There there is a like one or two things I could talk about if you if people want to stick around, but that's pretty much all I had planned um so far. Yeah, Devin, I think uh we can cover those other ones you mentioned. Okay. Okay. If people have time, they can stick around and check them out. If you got a bounce, you can check out the recording of this when I get it up on our YouTube channel. Okay. Yeah, so I'll go ahead and talk about the the the, the other multi-axis thing I had since it's kind of we're kind of in that topic right now. Um, something that, and I, I apologize that you know this isn't a super fancy uh, model of this. I don't have a super fancy model. And let me turn off my rapid motion. So in this situation, you know, I just created a simple a simple like surface or two or three surfaces showing a parallel toolpath. So this parallel toolpath is using this line right here to establish the profile. And it's doing a step over, oh, what did I set the step over to? It's doing a step over of a maximum step over about 50 thou. Well, you can already tell from the, the side here that that's definitely not 50 thou. If I were to back plot this sucker, it would not look pretty. Don't pay attention to the rapids. I didn't really focus too much on the tool axis control. I just wanted to show you the motion here. So not only is it not starting at the parallel, it's kind of jumping all over the place and not doing a constant sweep like I kind of wanted. So definitely not my preferred there because it's jumping back and forth, jumping back and forth, jumping back and forth. And then once it finally hits that point, it starts doing the starts working its way to the parallel and of course that would be the opposite if i had my step over flipped but what is happening in the background is when we have that step over set to 50 thousands we have that step over set to the 50 thousands it's looking at this line right here down in the bottom corner and it's echoing that out 50 thousands and to better show this I will turn on these arcs here. You can see that it's working its way. It's step, 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 step. And then once it starts to intersect with this other surface, it'll click, it'll hit this face, move to this face, hit this face, move to this face, and so on and so forth. It keeps going back and forth, back and forth. Because that step over is only is echoing out from that line. It's not, it doesn't care about the surface. It doesn't, it doesn't care about the surface when it comes to the step over. There's a setting in the tool path that fixes this. If I go in the parameters, and I believe it's in the advanced options for surface quality under the cut pattern. Currently the method is set to approximate. So that's exactly what that approximate is going to do. It's going to echo out that chain. It's going to echo out that chain and hit whatever it hits. That's the end of the end of the story. However, we also have exact. What exact will do is it'll get rid of all my other settings. I'm going to exit this out because I've already generated this toolpath. And now we got a nice constant step over all throughout the surface. So what that essentially does is that now is looking at the surface and trying to maintain that step over on that surface and trying to stay consistent with that chamfer. And it kind of turns it into a little bit of an equal scallop sort of a thing. So it's no longer echoing out from that line, it's stepping over, looking at the surface and moving all the way around the surface. Now, why would you, why wouldn't you have that set all the time? Well, it does take a lot longer to process. I, I shouldn't say a lot longer. It takes, it takes, it takes longer to process and to generate. And the reason that is, is because now all of a sudden it went from, oh, hey, I'm just going to echo this line out and see what I hit. It's going from, oh, okay, so we're coming, we're starting with this surface. We're going to make our way, make our way, make our way. Okay, now we're going on this surface, make our way, make our way, make our way, going on this surface. So now all of a sudden it's trying to, trying to watch those surfaces. So if you start noticing it jumping around on you with parallel, if you start noticing and jumping around, I believe I also saw it in another toolpath I can't remember at the moment. Um, if it's jumping around on you, uh, that might be something you might want to check because uh, right now that parallel, all it's going to do is it's going to echo out 
it's going to echo out these steps. So I hope that I hope that made sense. Um, I know that this is a very very dumbed down model, but hope I got the the point across here. This was actually something I threw together uh, uh, about a week ago when someone was asking me about it, or one of our coworkers was asking me about it. So, but yeah. And the only other thing I had that I, I kind of wanted to talk about that I didn't think got into the webinars was there was an addition to the Verify. Um, and I don't know if I have a, a great part to show this off with, but I'll just bring back my, um, I'll bring back my corner pretreatment. I think that'll show it. So if I run this sucker through the Verify, you guys may have noticed that we have we have some different settings up here right next to the stop conditions. So the NC mode is what we're already used to. That's what's been in the previous versions for the longest time. And what that'll do is that'll speed it up, or that will that will just go from point to point to point to point. And sometimes it's a little too fast for people. And when they have it on slow, it still looks like it's jumping on them. But now we have also time where what this will do is this will give us real time uh, speeds and feeds, or at least feeds. Now, I didn't really set a good feed rate, but this is real time. The only thing I will tell you guys though, is I believe the middle of this dial is one for one, but you can speed it up and slow it down. And I just don't, uh, there is no real way to get it back to the center very easily. Like you can't just double click it and it'll go back to center like, I thought, but you know, that's a request for another time. But you could still speed this up and slow it down, but now it's kind of going at a real speed that we're used to. And then the last one is kind of, it's looking at the length. So it's looking at it, it's not looking at the feed rate, but it's looking at the length of the, of the line. Um, so as the G1 to the N1 is kind of going from point to point, the length is looking at it from a from a path perspective. It's not looking at this step and this step. It's showing us the transitions through those steps and showing us that movement. And how I had it described to me before is, you know, this is the one you kind of want to use if you think that the the motion's jagged, even when you slow it down a lot. Again, if you guys wanted to see that compared to G1, if I hit play, it's a lot, lot faster. Again, it's showing us that motion, but it's a lot more point to point sort of deal. But the length is kind of guiding us through it. So length might be my, my go-to from now on, just because um, I have seen in some cases on some PCs, G1 is a little bit jittery just because that's the that's the previous mode that it used to be but the length and the time is much much smoother when it comes to seeing the motion and i just wanted to bring that up because i know i i literally had a, a student yesterday who's talking about oh, it just moves so fast and then i showed them that in 2021 and it, it was smooth as butter and uh it was uh he was very happy to see that because i know I, I you probably guys probably already know i know this isn't the lathe webinar but if you guys have used Mastercam Lay, sometimes the verify is a little quick. So those two options really help slow things down for you and smooth things out. But that's pretty much all I had. I didn't even know that was new. That's a, that's a good one, Devin. Mm -hmm. So again, thanks everybody for attending. Enjoy the rest of your Wednesday and we'll talk to you all soon. Thanks guys.